Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is existential psychology, and with me is Dr. Rollo May. Dr. May is one of the founding sponsors of the Association for Humanistic Psychology and a genuine pioneer in the field of existential psychology and clinical psychology. He was recently awarded the Distinguished Career in Psychology Award by the American Psychological Association. He's the author of numerous classic books, including The Courage to Create, Love and Will, The Meaning of Anxiety, Freedom and Destiny, and Psychology in the Human Dilemma. Welcome, Dr. May. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have <clears throat> you here. You're, you're really, I think, most known uh, these days as a pioneer in establishing existential psychology as an independent discipline in the, in the clinical area. And that's a discipline which, unlike most forms of clinical psychology that rely on a, a medical model or a behavioral model, relies more on a philosophical model. And, and uh, you draw heavily on the works, I think, of philosophers uh, such as Sartre, Heidegger, Kierkegaard, who, mm. who deal with basic notions such as anxiety in a different way than, than most medical clinicians do. Yes. Well, when I was in my, in the uh, year, I think, 56 or 57, the publishers called me up and asked if I would edit a book on European existential psychotherapy. And I was delighted to hear there was such a book. I hadn't known a thing about the existential movement, but I knew that in this country I believed in it very firmly, because they are the ones who emphasize anxiety, ang uh, they emphasize uh, the individual courage, they emphasize guilt feeling, it has to be taken into consideration at least, and they see human beings as struggling, sometimes successful, sometimes not successful, and this was exactly the model that we needed for psychotherapy. Uh, the medical model had turned out to be a dead end, and I w uh, welcomed the chance to edit this book of, of uh, existential uh, <coughs> chapters from Europe, and it was, uh, it, it met my own needs in my own heart. Would I be correct in, in assuming that when you speak of anxiety, you don't think of it as a symptom to be removed, but rather as a gateway for exploration into the, the meaning of life? Yes. Well, you got that exactly right. Now, I think anxiety is associated with creativity. When you're in a situation of anxiety, you can, of course, run away from it. And that's certainly not constructive. Or you can take a few pills to get you over it, or cocaine, or whatever else you may take. You could meditate. Uh, well, you could meditate, but I think none of those things, including meditation, which mm -hmm. I happen to believe in, but none of those paths uh, lead you to creative activity. Mm -hmm. What anxiety means is it's as though the world is knocking at your door, and you need to create. You need to make something, you need to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think anxiety thus is uh, for, for people who, are, uh, who have found their own heart and their own souls. Uh, for them it is a stimulus toward, toward creativity, toward courage. It's what makes us human beings. Mm -hmm. I suppose much of our anxiety comes from the basic human dilemma uh, of being yeah, mortal, of yeah, ultimately yeah. having to confront our own demise. Yeah. Yeah. We are conscious of our own selves, our own tasks, uh, and also we know we're going to die. Man is the only creature, men, women, and children sometimes even, are the only creatures who can be aware of their death. Uh, and out of that comes normal anxiety. Mm -hmm. And when I let myself feel that, then I uh, apply myself to new ideas, I write books, I communicate with my fellows, uh, and uh, in other words, the creative interchange of human personality rests upon the fact that we know we're going to die. Uh, of that the animals and the grass and so on knows nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but our knowledge of our death is what gives us a normal anxiety 
that says to us, make the most of these, of these years you are alive. And that's what I've tried to do. Mm -hmm. Another source of anxiety that you've described in your writing is, is our very freedom, the, oh, yes. our ability to make choices yeah, and to have yeah. to confront the consequences of those choices. Yes, that's right. Freedom is the, uh, also the mother of anxiety. If you had no freedom, you'd have no anxiety. That's why the slaves in the films are people without any expression on their faces. Uh, they have no freedom. But those of us who do have are alert, alive. We're aware that what we do matters uh, and uh, that we only have about 70 or 80 or 90 years in which to do it. So why not do it and get joy out of it rather than running away from it? So I think that's a little capsule mm -hmm. of the meaning of anxiety. Yeah. But isn't there a little bit of a a conflict between feeling anxiety and allowing oneself to be open, vulnerable to that feeling of anxiety, and then also seeking joy. Oh no, mm -hmm. uh, there's a conflict between that uh, and what's co generally called happiness, uh -huh. or the the flat. I would speak of of the meaningless forms of uh, feeling good. I'm not against anybody feeling good or having happy hours. But joy is something different from that. Joy is the zest that you get out of uh, using your talents, your understanding, uh, your, the totality of your being uh, for uh, great aims. The mu musicians, the men who uh, wrote music, Mozart and Beethoven and the rest of them, they always uh, showed considerable anxiety because they were in the process of loving beauty, uh, of uh, feeling joy when they heard a beautiful uh, mm -hmm. uh, combination of notes. Now that's uh, the kind of feeling that goes with uh, creativity. That's why I say the courage to create. Creation does not come out of uh, simply what you're born with. That must be united with your courage. Uh, which both both of which cause anxiety, but also great joy. It seems that uh, much of our modern culture, though, is an attempt to cope with this fundamental anxiety by uh, diversions in uh, yeah. what, what you've called banal pleasures. Yeah, well, you just put your finger on the most significant aspect of modern society. And we try to avoid anxiety by getting rich, by making... Uh, hundred thousand dollars when we're 21 years of age by becoming millionaires. Now none of those things uh, lead to the joy, the creativity that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, one can own the world uh, and still be without the inner sense of, of pleasure, of joy, of courage, of creation. Uh, and I think our society is in the midst of a vast change. The society that began at the Renaissance uh, now is ending. Uh, and we are seeing the results of this ending of a social mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. uh, in the fact that psychotherapy has grown uh, with such uh, great zest. Almost every other person in California is a psychotherapist. <laughs> it seems that way. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And this always happens when an age is dying. You see, the Greeks began their great uh, age in the seventh, six centuries BC, uh, and then they talked of beauty and goodness and truth, all these great things that the philosophers talked about. Yes. Uh, but uh, by the third century, uh, second century BC, and first century BC, that had all been forgotten. The philosophers now talked about security, and they uh, tried to help people uh, get along with as little pain as possible. Mm -hmm. And they made uh, mottos for human beings. Beauty and truth and goodness had been lost. Now our Renaissance began the modern age, uh, and at the beginning of an age, there are no psychotherapists. 
This is taken care of by religion and by art uh, and by beauty, by music. But at the end of an age, every age down through history has been the same. Uh, every uh, other person becomes a therapist because there are no, uh, no ways of ministering to people in need. Mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, form long lines to the psychotherapist's office. I think it's a sign of the decadence of our age mm -hmm. rather than the sign of our uh, great intelligence.